Hello, bonjour. My name is Megan, and on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I would like to welcome you to our virtual OAG Artist Talk with Tiffany April. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. In this video, I am pleased to introduce Tiffany April. Following her University of Ottawa MFA thesis exhibition, The Surgeon and the Magician, at the OAG in 2019, Tiffany April returns to speak about her artistic practice, her work, and what she's up to now. Tiffany April is a visual artist working in painting and light-based installation. April completed her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Studio Art at Concordia University in 2014, and her MFA at the University of Ottawa in 2019. She was shortlisted for the RBC Emerging Artist Award in 2020. Her work is nationally and internationally collected, and in 2018, joined the City of Ottawa's art collection. April participated in TACT residency in Berlin and has exhibited in Canada and abroad, including both in Berlin and South Korea. April works in her Ottawa-based studio at Studio Space Ottawa. This artist talk will be approximately 35 minutes long. I would also like to mention that you can join us on the OAG's Instagram Live on Friday, July 24th at 4 p.m. for a live conversation between Tiffany and Catherine Sinclair, OAG's Deputy Director, Chief Curator, where they will be chatting together and you can ask questions in a live setting as well. Without further ado, I would like to hand the screen over to Tiffany. Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us virtually for this uh, virtual artist talk. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I live and work is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'd also like to thank Catherine Sinclair and Megan Ho for inviting me back to discuss my practice with you today. I recently graduated from the MFA program at Ottawa U, and I was very honored to have my thesis exhibition selected for the Ottawa Art Gallery last August. So for those of you who are not familiar with my work, I'll preface the rest of my talk with a little bit of information about the ideas that uh, inform and fuel my practice. So in a nutshell, I've cultivated a practice of painting and light-based installation around the concept of the post-human, which foregrounds the similarities between human, digital, and natural structure. My post-human viewpoint is not anthropocentric and it's not centered in dualism. Rather, I believe the social and biological structures surrounding human and non-human relationships are fluid, making us interconnect with and interdependent on all other um, beings. So in my most recent work, I've been focusing on unlearning the Western dualism of human and nature, which places humans in their own kind of unique category, decidedly separate from the rest of the natural world. I use the metaphor of the digital image to deconstruct these ideologies and subsequently build my own post-human uh, depictions. I'm particularly interested in the digital images, atemporality or lack of linear time, anti-spatiality, and malleable scaffolding of code. So I'm using the digital in my work um, not as a reference to digital as a medium, um, rather I'm referencing the idea of the digital, what it represents conceptually and metaphorically. I explore the way the digital image is changing how I navigate and understand reality, just as uh, past artists such as futurist Carlo Cara were fascinated with the camera's effect on human understanding of perception. So Cara was inspired by motion as it was captured in the photographic studies of Edward Muybridge. And Muybridge made visible what had previously been imperceptible to the human eye, making explicit the limits of the human senses. I'm likewise interested in new technologies development and how it's affecting my own experience of being in and uh, moving through the world. I link the flexibility of the digital image and structure of code and algorithms to social and biological relationships between humans and non-humans. By subscribing these relationships to the fluidity of coding, I want to suggest their innate similarity and their infinite malleability. My recent research has changed how I address the figure ground relationship in my work. So using a reduced palette of pastels, I push the merging of figure and ground to create a confusion of forms. Often, as in a field is what a field does, the figure almost dissolves entirely into its surroundings, leaving only subtle traces of its presence. So I tend to work quickly when I'm painting. I rotate the canvas, um, I allow things to drip 
a night four paint, as well as taking a more reductive approach. So wiping away to create forms through negative space. I aim to depict a uh, sensation rather than direct representation. And I create relationships between my figures and their environments, similar to the way that uh, the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty describes human interaction with the world. And Merleau-Ponty explains this interaction through the metaphor of hands touching each other, simultaneously touching while being touched. I paint figures who aren't exclusively acting on or within their environments, but whose environments and surroundings are also shaping them. So for several years, I have been doing these small studio studies with reflective materials, and this really took on a new life when I discovered using flexible acetate and mirror spray paint. And these studies really began as an interest in the materiality or immateriality of light, the mirror as a location for the creation of virtual images, and its ability to offer viewers an objective third-person perspective of themselves. So I understand the virtual as a perceptual phenomenon. It's an image that's created through perception. It's not physically tangible, but yet it still has an effect on our experience of reality. So in today's day and age, um, the experience of virtual images has become ingrained in our daily lives. And it really guides and informs how we understand and navigate the world. So three-dimensional real-time is combining with the two-dimensional anti-temporal space of the screen. And I've recently been comparing the screen and the mirror to one another. Painting has a very long history with the metaphorical window, mainly as a reference to a passage between the interior psyche and exterior physical environment. Um, whether this is through literal painted depictions of windows or conceptually conceiving of painting as a window. So thanks to surveillance technologies, smartphones and computers, our idea of the window has really become inverted. So the screen connects us to the world but makes us both observers and observed. I identify with the minimalist and post-minimalist movements of the 1960s and 70s, which were influenced by phenomenology. So the, the philosophical study of consciousness and human experience through the senses. Following this philosophy, uh, minimalists and post-minimalists sought to create awareness of our emotional body bodily relationship to objects and space. At times, minimalist artists would implement these ideas through the use of mirrors. Uh, this would fragment perspective, disorient viewers in space, and create a visual relationship between objects and architecture. So Robert Morris's untitled William's Mirrors was a large installation of mirror panels facing one another that would infinitely reflect the viewer in space. And Morris's mirrors flatten our breathing bodies into dispersed two-dimensional surfaces, eliminating all the tactile distinction between the clothes we're wearing and the flesh beneath. For me, mirrors are a way of flattening viewers and their surroundings, including them in the piece like any other material, while also heightening their awareness of their body and space. So their compressed forms really become a part of my non-hierarchical spaces. Oops. Now, Intangible was my first large light installation. Uh, it consisted of a piece of mirror acetate, the projected image of one of my paintings, and a small mechanism called a solenoid. So the solenoid would uh, tap the mylar and um, as it was reflecting the projected image, and this would distort and expose the kind of underlying RGB colors of uh, the reflection. So I've got a little bit of a video here to give you an example of that. So to me, this piece felt like a two-way exchange. Um, instead of viewers only looking at the projected image, the image also reached out into their environment, becoming a part of their physical spatial experience. My approach to painting, therefore, really takes into account the inversion of the window. So it acknowledges the window as an access point to a sensorial experience of the external world, but also a screen that allows for self-reflection and critical observation. Now, when I talk about figures in my work, um, I want to explain that the figures I paint aren't meant to be representations of real people, but rather representations of sensation. In discussing Francis Bacon's work, Gilles Deleuze explains that Bacon paints figures with a capital F. So these figures are expressions of sensation acting on the body or nervous system. So Bacon shapes his figures distortions around an internal source of psychological sensation. 
I create my figures as representations of my sensorial and philosophical navigation between the spaces of tangible reality and the digital ritual. Bacon's figures are isolated and the force of their contortions seems to originate internally. My figures distortions are a result of their interaction with their surroundings. So in A New Chameleon, the figure is heavily abstracted and constructed from my painterly responses to deliberate abstract force. The shape and sense of movement in the abstracted form feels really driven by an energy outside of itself. My approach to temporality, form, and color has shifted in order to better represent my post-human spaces and their function as environments for shaping the human. I look to the Enlightenment period of Baroque and Rococo art to dissect their political and aesthetic language and repurpose it for a more post-human perspective. So my color palette has, in, for these reasons, shifted to monochromes and light-hearted Rococo colors of pastels and white. My forms break down into the classical curves, serpentine lines, and the dynamic bodily contortions that are often associated with Baroque and Rococo. So from this art historical period, I look to Jean-Honoré Fregenard, and Fregenard melds his figures into their environment. He achieves this through the consistency of brush marks between the figure and their surroundings as well as the use of a shared color palette between the two. And this tends to actively dissolve the foreground into the background. So Fragonard also deviated from the factual into the more imaginative and mythological in his representations. I find this emphasizes the core essence of the Rococo as a general feeling of liberty. From the Baroque, I look to Tiepolo, who likewise melts his figures uh, with their surroundings in his approach to color, however, with a bit of a harsher interruptions between forms. So for example, in the kind of bottom corner, I'm gonna point with my mouse, this figure here, who seems to be kind of reclining with his head back, um, is really struggling um, to maintain a dominance of its position in the foreground because of his claw. Um, so his, the body seems to share similar coloration to these areas, which shift between foreground and background. And in this way, um, figure's face, or the silhouette, seems to carve out the negative space of the cloth. I also associate with the Baroque for its focus on the senses and the vitality of space. Um, so for me, the disregard for barriers between artistic categories, um, which happened in the Baroque time, um, makes it a time of experimentation and invention. So for example, there's a lot of merging of painting, architecture, and optics to create unified emotional experiences of space. Whereas in the past, um, in the Baroque period, this physiological experience was meant to overwhelm an individual's senses and reinforce the power of the political elite through its sheer grandeur and propagandic symbology. I would like to flip the script and express an environment suggestive of a flat ontology, a term coined by Graham Harmon. So Harmon has suggested a flat ontology as a new way of considering being in Western culture. Flat ontology places all beings in a single category, um, which is non-hierarchical, emphasizing that all beings, including those that are imagined, affect other beings around them through participation in networks of interaction. So our daily network of interactions are saturated with digital images. I see the digital image as our contemporary Baroque space of liberty and imagination. And for this reason, I've adopted certain qualities of the digital image that I feel make it a bit of a, a subversive space. And one of those qualities is its disconnect from chronological time or atemporality. Theorist Franco Berardi describes the experience of digital time in the digital virtual as infinitely expandable in all directions because it's removed from cultural and emotional signifiers of time. So for example, social media um, platforms often have news feeds of users' posts but these are now um, ordered according to an algorithm and not in chronological order. So you might see a post from five days ago before you see a post from say 20 minutes ago. So I approach representation of time in my work through drips, layers, spirals, and curved lines that allow the past and the present to kind of coexist simultaneously. In When You Sense the Forest Breathing, this piece here, abstract ribbons curl and wind, they flow together in a kind of coherent stream and other times tend to branch off to stand alone. 
I use the movement of the spiral or curved line to create a sense of constant transformation and exchange between the figure and its environment. So Christine Busi Glucksmann describes the spiral as defying time because it is the image of time. It's a cosmic flux, a surge, a process, uh, turning in an everlasting cycle. And this three-dimensional spiral in space is also known as a helix. The helix, through its corkscrew rotation, activates the space around it, defining an interior and exterior um, through its movement. I find the dismantling of linear time that occurs in the digital virtual very liberating because it's a stark reminder that time isn't a linear and fixed structure. Um, it doesn't always adhere to the rules we have set around it. And I find that opens the door to questioning the other basic structures of human belief um, that kind of act as a scaffolding for um, our register of our experience. So I take an atemporal approach to time in my own paintings, allowing the past and the present to coexist uh, simultaneously. I do this through the interruption, uh, through interrupting marks um, by masking off. So kind of these hard edge lines um, that you see within the pieces as well as creating layers of transparencies. Um, and this really makes the order in which these marks came into existence very unclear, as in a daisy chain link where everything appears to be kind of happening all at once. So my use of drips also brings uh, competing sensations of time into the painting. Through their fluid materiality, drips just automatically read as temporal. Um, they emphasize the link between gravitational force and time. So the less viscous the paint, the faster it will flow. My past action in manipulating the canvas um, to achieve these various directional drips likewise recalls the past into the present moment of viewing uh, because the viewer will kind of sense uh, that past action through the piece. So for my thesis exhibition, The Surgeon and the Magician, I used unconventional hanging in order to emphasize certain characteristics of each painting and create an overall sensation of flux within the space. So for example, time spirals, I'll point to the piece in the top left corner here, um, was hung slightly higher than the other pieces um, or higher than traditional height and it cut the corner of the wall. So by using the empty space behind it and the height of the wall, I was able to emphasize its sense of buoyancy. Likewise, in the second half of the room, refracting and reforming was this piece in the left corner again was hung highest of all the pieces in the space um, to bring notice to the height of the ceiling as well as to emphasize the very dramatic vertical downward movement of this core here. Yeah, so its height brought notice to the loftiness of the gallery walls and the use of diffused lighting in the space created this sense of um, openness, so really bringing notice to all areas of the gallery space rather than kind of spotlighting a certain spot. So the title of the exhibition came from a segment of Walter Benjamin's text, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And in this particular text, Benjamin is comparing painting to, um, to the new form of media at the time, which was film. He compares the filmmaker to a surgeon because they can dive deeply into reality, they can dissect it and rearrange it through its qualities of zoom, slow motion, camera angles, and scene cuts. So filmmakers can get in close and examine kind of the organs of perception, time, viewpoint, and lighting to create this whole new experience of reality. Painters, on the other hand, Benjamin calls magicians because they keep themselves at a certain distance uh, from reality. I chose this title because my practice is equally entrenched in the worlds of the surgeon and the magician. Only in today's, um, in today's society, digital imaging has become the new surgeon. But since graduating from the MFA program in August of 2019, I have been teaching myself to code using a uh, software called Processing. I've previously been using found video in my light installations, uh, for example, scenes from nature, so it would be kind of a, a sky view with uh, trees blowing or, or a continuous waterfall. But I really wanted to uh, branch out and start exploring the process of creating um, digital images or digital modes of creating imagery. So I've made several Photoshop images that deconstruct the figure. Um, these were done in Photoshop. And the sense of movement, dispersal, and decomposition in these images 
are the inspiration for my the future animated visuals that I hope to create in processing. And never in my life did I think I was going to be teaching myself to code for my artistic pro uh, practice and uh, enjoying it so much. I'm currently teaching myself the basics of geometric forms, animation, interactivity, color, and 3D rendering. But going forward, I am most interested in creating visuals that really mimic natural textures, patterns of growth and movement, but which um, remain distinctly digital in their ability to kind of shape shift and disconnect from laws of gravity and linear time. So this brings me to the second element of the digital that I apply to my post-human spaces, and that's its disconnect from geometric space. I can fuse geometric space and let it expand into nondescript two-dimensional spaces. So this spatial disconnect is created through drips, expansive um, areas of color, and shifts between positive and negative spaces um, that often don't offer solid descriptors of spatiality. So I think of these spaces as voids. Now voids are commonly thought of as these kind of manifestations of nothingness. However, the void spaces in my paintings um, are actually active spaces of potential and not nothingness. Um, I think of the void in this way because of my understanding of the space within particles. So there's this, um, though there's empty space in matter, it is active space. And in theoretical particle physics, this empty space is revealed to be actually populated by constant interaction and exchange between quarks, a type of elementary particle, and gluons, which are subatomic particles. So all in all, uh, empty space is actually quite a paradox. And Busi Glucksmann refers to the void and the Baroque and Baroque art as the mystical Baroque nothingness of the emptiness of fullness, which she says is addressed through the eccentric spiral, unending vortices, false perspectives, and the light found in Renaissance painting that tends to emerge from the background of landscapes to bathe and liberate bodies and other matter while annihilating them. I use many of the same visual tools in my own practice, but I'm interested instead in their paradoxical function of expressing the fullness of emptiness. Constant fluctuation between positive and negative space is my way of describing the void in my painting. When built up in layers, objects and figures defined in negative space are never truly static or empty because past marks fill their emptiness. For example, in my piece Time Spirals, there's a tension in the kneeling leg that keeps flipping back and forth between foreground and background. So the foot, which is just down here, kind of in that peachy color is painted in positive space but is immediately pushed back to negative space through the expansive wash of kind of burgundy and dabs of uh, yellow red uh, yellow orange paint to contradict that uh, there's this transition between this soft blue and a very um, dramatic brush stroke of burgundy that carves the right knee back out and into the foreground and positive space the continual transition from positive to negative space uh, makes it feel as though um, marks are coming together and then moving apart again. So kind of being contained temporarily in a vessel whose barriers don't actually contain it. The negative space feels as though it might transition into positive space at any moment and vice versa. So my use of drips also confuses geometric space uh, through the defiance of natural, gravi natural gravitational force and the creation of a sense of vertigo. So for these reasons, the void spaces in my paintings are active spaces of potential and not nothingness. I've adopted the atemporal and anti-spatial structures of the digital into my paintings to create spaces that feel non-specific. Um, so they're a bit more open to new organizational rules. I place similar hues at varying locations or in large expanses across the canvas to create a spatial flattening. In Warped and Wefted, uh, these small shifts between pinks, yellows, greens, and blues cover over three quarters of the canvas. And the upper half of the um, painting becomes this ethereal horizonless space. So I hint at spatial elements that might round the viewer but that are never fully realized. So without the inclusion of say a solid horizon line, the space becomes disorienting. And this brings us to the third quality of the digital image that I've taken on, and that's its underlying structure of code and algorithms. So I consider the isolated painterly mark to be the underlying code of painting. 
because its identity is ambiguous and in that sense it's malleable in its context. This quality is paramount in understanding my linking of post-human reimagining to the digital. As I mentioned earlier, I use the fluidity of the digital image as a metaphor for ways of being. And what I mean by that is I equate biological structures to code and algorithm. Every pixel of the digital image can be changed through a tweak in its coding. Similarly, all animate and inanimate beings are built from the same basic particles, patterns, and DNA, which only deviated from each other uh, through chemical reactions and evolution. The fluidity of DNA was a major theme in the movie Annihilation. Uh, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend. Great fun. <laughs> the premise of the film was an alien life form on Earth, um, lands on Earth and begins refracting the DNA of every living thing in its vicinity. So plants, non-human animals, and human beings begin to sh share DNA with one another, and they slowly become these new beings that exist between the biological categories that uh, we're quite familiar with. Or for a less sci-fi example, there's the Fibonacci sequence, um, which you might be familiar with. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence is a mathematical series of numbers found in growth patterns in nature. So it's most well known for the spiral formation in shells and the seed patterns in plants, um, but it can also be found in the human body. So for example, um, the spiral of the ear or the length of bones in the human hand and arm. Now historian Yuval Noah Harari also equates human emotions and behaviors to survival instincts, which are essentially algorithms. And these determine our reaction in certain circumstances. So in thinking about DNA and particles and behaviors as code, all organic and inorganic beings and technology relate to each other on a fundamental level. So From Above was a sculpture I made while really considering the role of abstraction in my work as a kind of decoding of the human figure. From Above was the first projection piece that actually included a more prominent uh, figurative outline and multiple mirror acetate reflections in space. Uh, previously, I had been working with only a single reflected beam of light. I'll show you a, this is a view from the front, I'll show you a view from behind. Um, so there's the screen, backlit. These are the floating, well, floating tongue <laughs> mirror pieces. And this is a bit of an example of the abstracted reflections that would have been rotating around the room uh, in various directions and speeds. So I saw the multiplicity of the reflections in this work as entities exceeding the bodily limits of the figurative outline and becoming like pixels or particles breaking off from the original image. So I now look to paint and the purely painterly mark as the DNA or ones and zeros of the painted image. I tend to describe spatial features and elements in more limited information so that they almost fall away into kind of pure color and form. However, um, subtle semblances of reality still contextualize the space, pushing the painted marks towards a bit more of a coherent representational uh, reading, yet they still remain open to other identities. So pores, strips, and brush marks make the materiality of paint explicit while leaving breathing room for imaginative readings of forms. So they can be understood as belonging to or, or constructing a certain figure or object, but they don't feel married to that form. For example, in Hoplimit, uh, where the large spill of pink paint seems to be kind of emanating from the figure's face, this can read either as a figure's face or maybe a jellyfish or simply a paint form. Uh, similarly, the dark purple brush mark, uh, curving mark here, um, it reads as a brush mark, but it also can read as a, a definition of a shoulder. And this information could easily be removed from Hoplimit and placed into another painting to take on another identity. So my painted marks exist in the space like stem cells or pixels that haven't been uh, specialized into a specific function. Hop limit is also a great example of my purposeful decentering of the human figure by laying it horizontally across the canvas and using pores and drips to loosen its identifying elements. The most dominant first impression isn't the recognizable human element. The figure becomes apparent only after a longer process of looking. In this piece, the square format was also uh, quite great in allowing me freedom from historical notions of horizontality referencing landscape and verticality referencing portraiture. So the square became this more ambiguous space for my figure to exist in. 
I've gotten a lot of inspiration from the sculptor David Altmed. Um, Altmed also creates um, these uh, mingling of DNA that's very similar to the film Annihilation. Um, so he strikes a balance of his sculpture's identities that kind of perfectly straddles the definition of human and object and animal. Uh, at times his figures proliferate into space and seem to be transitioning identities as they go. However, due to the lack of linear temporality, because it is a literal fixed sculpture, uh, the directionality of their transition is ambiguous. Um, so you can't be sure if, say, the human head is transitioning into a bird or vice versa. Because of this, there is no hierarchy in Altman's approach to his subject's identities. I have been creating my own assemblages for about two years. Um, I use a cube frame made out of wood with interchangeable panes of plexiglass to layer and combine reflective materials with uh, organic and inorganic objects. I then uh, project images onto these assemblages to fracture and commingle the figure with other beings and objects. Um, sorry, those projections are of figures. Um, I then take photographs of the assemblages and use these photos as my source uh, material for my painting. And this is a photo of uh, one of my assemblages with a projection on it. Um, they're a little difficult to photograph. <laughs> uh, Christine Busi Glucksmann's concept of the flux image describes the digital image as existing without edges, without an inside and an outside, without an original. Flat and yet layered, it's no longer an image of pre existing reality, it is productive of reality. So, my reflection box uh, manifests the fluidity and changeability of the digital image in a more material form. In its maneuverable layers of plexiglass, the ephemerality of light, and the lack of one true original uh, representation. So it really allows me to physically engineer reality using aspects of digital materiality. I see these assemblages as physical manifestations of digital images. So the creation of my source material um, is very integral to um, my painting process. Uh, what I bring forward into my paintings from these assemblages is uh, best described by Jane Bennett uh, as the effervescence of the agency of individuals acting in concert with each other. In my paintings, this presents itself as a melding of human characteristics with other organic, non-organic, and abstract elements. So I organize these elements to feel as though they consist, uh, they consist a part of the figure. So I'll show a little example here where in cross-pollination, a flower head seems to be simultaneously uh, sitting in front of the figure's face while also making up a portion of the silhouette in the suggestion of a nose uh, right here and some eyelashes, quite long eyelashes. Um, by juxtaposing uh, transitions from positive to negative space, elements tend to weave in and out of each other in shallow depth. Uh, the ambiguous uh, figure feels as though it is created from a coming together of uh, many disparate parts. So the raw wood support in this piece uh, constantly transitions between being a raw support, background, and foreground. For example, the exposed wood um, in the middle creates this kind of uh, mountain-like form. So that seems to be kind of existing in positive space. But as you move your eyes down through the middle, it kind of recedes in relationship to these more kind of three-dimensional forms next to it. And again, this um, interruption of this blue-purple triangle pushes the exposed raw support here into a positive shape of an arc. So Rachel Rawson is a contemporary artist who has been uh, very influential to me in her depictions of um, the temporal and spatial structures of the digital. So her work explores the disconnect between mind and body experience in virtual reality. She often translates her own physical experience of um, partaking in uh, VR experiences into paintings with flat visual planes, elements that coexist simultaneously, and contain little to no spatial markers. The result of these techniques is a single plane where elements weave in and out of each other in constant interaction. In my own piece, Give and Take, uh, thin layers of pores and glazes dissolve the defining edges of my subject, dispersing it into its surroundings. 
As Francis Guerin points out in painted form, layers of color become empty to physical substance in their function as abstract qualities of light, movement, and surface. By dissolving forms into overlapping transparencies and denying them depth, I push my subjects into constant interaction and immateriality, much like the movement of images across the two-dimensional plane of the digital screen. So the digital virtual is unique in its ability to disconnect us from time and a sense of place. It allows us to enter a space where freedom from these preconceived structures creates an abstract environment that's open to new imaginative forms. In the digital virtual, all information and images are reduced to pixels on a screen. They become immaterial and infinitely maneuverable. I use the metaphor of the digital image as the basis for my post-human critique of Western conceptions that humans exist independently from the rest of the natural world. I'll conclude on this work, Imagined Order. Um, this work actually encompasses, or I feel encompasses all the transformations my practice has undergone in the last three years. It expresses my post-human understanding of the world and how the digital image has influenced that perception. So in this work, time and space become unhinged and the figure becomes inseparable from its surroundings. It blends into expansive fields of color and melds with objects and non-human beings. The human element has been really pushed to the peripheries um, while its representation is simultaneously deconstructed through abstraction. This denial of depth um, through fluctuation in positive and negative space, expanses of color, and the repetition of the same colors throughout the piece uh, flattens the visual plane. This leaves my figure no other choice but to negotiate a shared space. So the layering and revealing of the history of Marx through transparencies and negative space creates voids that feel active and full of potential. Imagined order perpetuates my post-human view that through its non-hierarchical approach to elements in the space allows non-human aspects equal precedence in the composition. I actively deconstruct Western notions of biological hierarchy through the metaphor of digital fluidity. It's anti-spatiality, non-linear temporality, and flexible skeleton of code. So my figures move through their world as a collaborative partner. They express a structural fluidity with a seemingly vital exchange of energy with their surrounding environment. The most effective way to make any social change in the direction of equality between humans and non-human beings is to make space for it and have role models. And I am trying to paint those role models and construct those spaces. Thank you for listening to me. Um, there will be an extended discussion um, with Catherine Sinclair uh, during our Instagram live. I hope to see you then.